Hello, and welcome to Oxford Archaeology's second online research seminar. My name is Leo Webley. I'm Head of Post Excavation at Oxford Archaeology South. The subject of this seminar is settlement and landscape in the Middle Bronze Age, the period from around 1500 to 1150 BC. We will be showcasing exciting results from recent excavations by Oxford Archaeology of Middle Bronze Age sites in five regions of Southern Britain, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Oxfordshire, Somerset and Sussex. You will then have the opportunity to hear a panel of distinguished experts discussing the results and to ask them your own questions. We're delighted to welcome to our expert panel Robert Johnston from Sheffield University, Amrin Cooper from Cambridge University, Jackie Novakovsky, an independent researcher formerly with the Cornwall Archaeological Unit, and the panel chair, Professor Emeritus John Barrett. Please do send in questions for the panel at any time during the seminar by writing them in the chat box. We will try to discuss as many of them as we can in the Q&A session at the end of the seminar. So why choose the Middle Bronze Age as the subject for this seminar? Well, this period has often been characterised as a major turning point in prehistory. In many regions, settlements and houses become more visible in the archaeological record than they are for the early Bronze Age, which has suggested that people became more settled in the landscape. Evidence for field systems and farming also becomes more common in what has sometimes been called a second agricultural revolution. However, it may now be a good time to reassess some of these ideas, given that many new Middle Bronze Age sites have been excavated in recent years. Previously, much of our evidence came from Wessex and the Sussex Downs. Now that we have found more sites elsewhere, can we see more regional variation? Did the same sequences of change happen everywhere? Can we see regional differences in the scale of communities and in the ways that people divided up the land? It may also be worth asking whether the stories we tell about farmsteads and fields in the Middle Bronze Age are too simplistic, too familiar. Are we missing something when we think of the settlements we excavate as family farms? At some of the sites you will hear about today, we have found that people used field boundaries to bury their dead or to place special objects such as bronze weapons. Could this suggest that fields had a significance beyond a purely practical use in farming? We will not be able to answer all of these questions today, but hope to add to the debate. For the first of our presentations on recent excavations of Middle Bronze Age sites by Oxford Archaeology, I will now hand over to Tom Phillips, who will discuss two fascinating sites from East Anglia. Hello, my name is Tom Phillips. I'm a post-excavation manager for Oxford Archaeology East. And to start off this seminar, I'm going to speak about two sites, firstly, Bell Farm in Norfolk and then Clay Farm in Cambridgeshire. What I would like to get across with these two sites is the variability that exists for Middle Bronze Age settlements, not just within East Anglia, but also within individual counties. So starting with Bell Farm, I thought I'd start with this uh, quite evocative reconstruction drawing of the settlement by John Kane. It's worth noting the ditched enclosure at its center with its roundhouses. And then this is framed by uh, a, more, a series of more unusual post and pit-like alignments. To set the scene for Bell Farm a little, it's just worth stating that later Bronze Age Norfolk is somewhat of an anomaly. Metalwork, so individual fine spots and hordes are widespread, as we can see here in this map. All the dots represent individual metalwork fine spots. Now you can particularly see them along the river valleys, but also on the Clayland uh, Plateau that extends through the centre of the county and south into Suffolk. Settlements historically have been less visible, perhaps because pottery within settlements is, is generally less, uh, is generally rare in the county. And so unless these settlements are encountered in large set piece excavations, it's difficult to identify them. That has changed a little over the, decade, over the last decade or so initially with another site that OA excavated at Ormsby in the Broads, which I'll mention later, and then through a small number of other sites, and one of, the, one of which is, is Bell Farm. So Bell Farm itself is located to the northwest of Norwich on glacial sands along the ridge of locally higher ground at about 32 metres OD, between the major river valleys of the uh, Wensum to the south and the Bure to the north. With the, with the smaller channel of the River Hall running closer to the site. And it was excavated as part of the Norwich Northern Distributor Road in 2016, where OA excavated 19 separate areas along a 20 kilometre route. The red outline here is, is the route of the road and you can see all the areas marked, as well as Bell Farm towards the western end. 
The Bell Farm settlement doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, there was also a smaller and in some ways more convincing contemporary settlement enclosure, uh, one kilometre to the east of Area 5, which I'll mention a bit later, and also substantial long-running boundary ditch to the west at Area 1. And there was also other possible Bronze Age ditches existing as crop marks, particularly uh, at the western end here. But it's not what I would call a, a large-scale field system. This is all of the Middle and Late Bronze Age features at Bell Farm with the ditched enclosure at the centre of a network of, of these post alignments. While there are other sites that uh, share some of the individual characteristics of Bell Farm, there's no other site that has quite this look in terms of its, its layout. Coming up with a sensible stratigraphic sequence here was very difficult. There was no relationships between the different post alignments or between the enclosure and the alignments. Instead, uh, we, went, uh, we went with certain assumptions mainly that the settlement developed over a period of time and then attempted to come up with a, with a, uh, a sequence of phases from there. There was clearly a separate late Bronze Age phase as well, and I think this adds weight to there being uh, more than one phase in the Middle Bronze Age. However, it is worth uh, stating that the sequence is, is subjective. Bell Farm started as a sub-rectangular ditched enclosure about 0.4 hectares in size with an entrance uh, along its uh, along the south and an alignment of po post holes forming the eastern side. There were two structures inside the enclosure, uh, including the example in the top photo with a southeast facing porch. And uh, we had a radiocarbon date from charcoal in the base of the enclosure ditch, which came back 1742 to 1559 BC, which is a little early, but allowing for the um, possibility that the, that the charcoal was already old, this could suggest a construction date right at the start of the Middle Bronze Age, between 1600 and 1500 BC. Pottery was scarce, only six years of Middle Bronze Age pottery came from the enclosure ditches, the other main occupation waste was, was burnt flint. Subsequently, the main post alignments were constructed and then further structures were built, so you can see the some of the main post alignments radiating away from the uh, or, or framed around the enclosure. And the posts in these alignments were set no more than about half a metre apart, sometimes, but sometimes much closer. On an average, they were 0.45 metres wide and just under 0.2 metres deep. The close spacing of the post holes would suggest that these were not typical fences, but could still have been closed barriers of posts linked by wattle. Closely spaced posts, even if they were roughly chest height and weaved with wattle, would have been visually impressive and this visual enhancement must have been a deliberate act, particularly thinking about the amount of precious timber resource it would have required. The truth is some of these, uh, some of the boundaries may have looked different from others. Um, two alignments were formed by what looked more like small pits than, than post holes. You can see in this, this photograph here, so this, this alignment coming off the eastern side of the enclosure, uh, more pit-like in their appearance. Other features included a short palisade trench, which flanked the inside of the enclosure ditch, perhaps a revetment for the inner bank with a post alignment on the outside. And you see that in this bottom photograph, so that's the, that's the palisade trench there. We've got the main phase one enclosure ditch and then uh, post alignment on the outside of the enclosure. You can see how close those post holes are set. Smaller compounds were then added in phase three, each with a structure and internal pitch. You can see to the east on the eastern side here. These could have been added at the same time as the earlier alignments, but there is a difference morphologically, and there does seem to be a sequence on the western side of the compounds with one alignment perhaps replacing another. You can see that in this photograph. So the original phase one alignment on the eastern side of the enclosure, the phase two pit like alignment, and then here is the compound. Uh, attached almost up to the east. And there were also two unearned, cremation which, unearned cremations which were buried in the upper fill of the enclosure ditch, uh, one of which in the southeastern terminal returned a radiocarbon date, which you can see there, 1448 to 1283 BC, which gives some indication uh, as to the, the date uh, of the upper fill of the enclosure ditch. Finally, this is the Late Bronze Age phase, which is worth highlighting as an important part of the sequence. Again, it's quite different as a relatively discrete group of structures 
uh, and pits which utilised the space to the north of what by that point was presumably a relict enclosure. The Late Bronze Age features actually had more occupation waste associated with them than the Middle Bronze Age settlement, including pottery, a decent amount of burnt flint, fire clay, including a few fragments from weights, and a spindle well. And there are also two radiocarbon dates uh, associated with the Late Bronze Age settlement, uh, which are labelled here, and these fit comfortably with the pottery and the phasing. Is there enough evidence to suggest this is definitely a settlement in the Middle Bronze Age? I think so. It has, has the structures, uh, such as the ones illustrated on the right here. It has domestic rubbish, um, not huge amounts, as can be seen from these distribution plots of the, the pottery and the, and the flint. Um, but this is not atypical uh, for Middle Bronze Age sites, especially, especially in Norfolk. Also, there's not enough evidence to suggest that this was something other than a settlement. The post alignments, um, although highly unusual, do seem to be acting as boundaries within a relatively discrete area of settlement. This is not a large area of field system for managing livestock. These boundaries uh, would be useless really for controlling cattle and the areas that they are enclosing are really too small for the purpose. Now the post architecture seen at Bell Farm is not entirely unparalleled in East Anglia. Certain characteristics find comparison on other sites but as I have said earlier nothing is uh, quite the same as Bell Farm. Also in Norfolk is Redgate Hill, is, uh, sorry Redgate Hill uh, on the north coast. This trapezoidal enclosure constructed using post holes is thought to have originated in the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age uh, with structures also dating to the early Bronze Age. Another comparable site uh, you can see in the bottom left was excavated prior to the construction of the Bedford uh, Northern Bypass, where a subsquare ditched enclosure of Middle Bronze Age date, about 85 metres square, was closely associated with a subrectangular palisaded enclosure formed of post holes, uh, with the two enclosures bisected by an internal alignment of post holes. Finally, the most recently excavated example uh, was found during excavation by OA at Melbourne in South Cambridgeshire, where a relatively large Middle Bronze Age settlement and associated field system was excavated. There was a total of nine post hole alignments uh, which were revealed, and these formed a distinct phase of rectangular enclosures or paddocks, um, along with uh, at least eight post-built roundhouses. And despite similarities with these other sites, there is a level of complexity associated with the Bell Farm alignments that is not exhibited elsewhere. Its rectilinear layout with its clear design to form these small settlement enclosures or compounds is quite unique really, um, with the nearest comparison perhaps being the Melbourne alignment, although there the enclosures appear to develop more organically. It's also worth referencing some of the other Middle Bronze Age settlement sites in Norfolk. There are still not many excavated examples, but from those that have been excavated, a common feature does seem to be a focus on a single enclosure of various forms, but generally rectangular or sub-rectangular. Sub While we have to assume that there were associated field systems with these settlement sites, as you would see uh, in other parts of the country, these do not stand out like they do in other areas, not like the settlement enclosures themselves, at least. To the east of Bell Farm and also part of the uh, Northern Distributor Road excavations with this small enclosure at Drayton Lane, also in uh, Horsford, on the same ridge of higher ground. It appeared isolated and neither evaluation nor excavation really picked up any signs uh, of the of, of associated features, yet the enclosure itself contained a lot more domestic rubbish, so pottery, pottery and notably later Bronze Age flint work than the whole of Bell Farm, so clearly this was a settlement enclosure. Also locally, the Bell Farm enclosure is very similar to a larger, ex uh, larger example excavated only five kilometres away at Old Catton. Uh, this was also excavated by OA only a couple of years ago. Uh, significantly, the, the Old Catton enclosure also had a post alignment which formed one of its sides on its northern side. So although it's uh, slightly larger, the form, the rectangular enclosure with a post alignment along one of its sides is very similar to Bell Farm. There's also internal structures 
uh, in the old Catton enclosure, although these did appear to be late Bronze Age. But yeah, the, the fact that the enclosure was associated with the postal alignment is, is significant. And you know, is this evidence for a local trend? If we are able to excavate more of this landscape in the future, will we find other contemporary settlements uh, with post alignments or post architecture? I've also already mentioned Ormsby in the Broads, uh, Ormsby St. Michael, excavated by OA in 2010. And this was formed of a substantial subsquare. Uh, enclosure covering about 1.3 hectares with a double ditched outer circuit visible as a crop mark in its unexcavated half. And finally, uh, Swan's Nest in Swaffham, which is in West Norfolk, recently excavated by NPS, is definitely worth mentioning. This is a large and imposing rectangular double ditched enclosure covering a total area of just over two hectares but divided into two approximately equal sections by internal ditches. The image uh, of the Bell Farm enclosure here is, is, the, is the same scale, just to emphasise the size of the Swan's Nest enclosure. And there were internal structures and remnants of burnt mound activity, uh, specifically dumps, uh, charcoal rich material, and burnt flint in some parts of the enclosure, enclosing ditches, as you can see in the, in the photograph here. And these factors uh, hint at settlement use once again. And it's also worth saying that there, there was a useful uh, reappraisal of aerial photographic evidence from around the site of Swan's Nest and although it is, it is it possible to pick up um, some elements which may be part of a Bronze Age field system again it, nothing looks as prominent as this enclosure which seems to be a focus of settlement and I'll finish with this reconstruction a second reconstruction of uh, Bell Farm which shows the, the site during phase two when the enclosure had already been in use for a while and the first Post alignments uh, have been constructed. So, in this part of northern East Anglia, it is revealing more of its Middle Bronze Age settlement pattern than was previously known, and it will un undoubtedly continue to do so in the future. Hopefully, this summary of the site has provided an overview of Bell Farm and to some extent wider themes, such as sites with post architecture and other Middle Bronze Age sites in Norfolk. And it's also a good contrast to the next site I'm going to talk about which is Clay Farm. So thinking again about the variability across the region, Clay Farm is very different from some of those sites already mentioned. It has a very different sequence of development with early strip fields, uh, then enclosures, and then settlement within the enclosures. Even within the Clay Farm excavations, there are two separate blocks of field system and settlement, and each of these are quite different. But both were associated with impressive evidence of domestic activity in terms of the fine assemblages recovered. This aerial photo uh, here is taken from the north at Clay Farm, looking across the excavation areas, with the eastern edge of the village of Trumpington also visible. Clay Farm is located on the south side of Cambridge and sits along the, gribble, uh, the gravel terraces of the River Cam. Uh, the river being located about one and a half kilometres to the west uh, of the site, and there's Clay Farm. More importantly, Clay Farm sits on the western side of a wide and shallow valley here, uh, which contains a minor tributary of the River Cam, formerly known as Hobson's Brook. And the Cam itself is a tributary of the Great Ooze, and further north and northwest in Cambridgeshire, the Ooze Valley has plentiful evidence for. Uh, Middle Bronze Age field systems and settlements, particularly in areas along the Fen Edge. Looking more closely then at the Valley of Hobson's Brook, we can see that it's, it's quite an extensive Middle Bronze Age landscape. So this, this shows all the ex, uh, excavated areas uh, and Middle Bronze Age features that have been found. It's also worth mentioning uh, that this landscape to the south of Cambridge has been extensively excavated excavated as areas have been developed for housing on the western side of the Hobson's Brook Valley and as Adam Brooks Hospital has expanded to the east. And for the Middle Bronze Age, the key sites are these three settlements marked here, which form almost a triangle. Two at Clay Farm on the western side of the valley and one on the eastern side. And this one here uh, is the AstraZeneca and Papworth Hospital site at the biomedical campus. So the core of the settlement here was excavated by Cambridge Archaeological Unit, with part of the peripheral field system out here excavated by OA. 
An impressive aspect of the Middle Bronze Age at Clay Farm is its chronology and how it developed during the period between around 1600 and 1150 BC. The evidence comes from the stratigraphy, but also from an extensive program of radiocarbon dating. And here you can see the four phases of development at Clay Farm during the Middle Bronze Age, starting with a very simple strip field system and gradually developing with rectilinear field systems and areas of settlement. So the earliest system of land division was this series of simple strip fields formed by narrow, shallow boundary ditches running down the contours and separated on average by about 70 to 90 metres. And a couple of them have early radiocarbon dates as well. Um, what's important about these is that it shows that by this time, the landscape was cleared enough to create this boundary system and that it was necessary for the communities using it. The central image here shows the northern fields in a bit more detail. So you can see the, the contours increasing from around 11 metres OD in the east up to about 16 metres in the west and the uh, strip fields, strip, strip field ditches running down the contours. And there were also some pre-existing landscape features, most notably an early Bronze Age barrow in the north and scattered early Bronze Age pits around the site. These features, as well as what we can't see, such as surviving areas of vegetation, must have influenced the um, surviving area, the, the early strip field system and the sizes of each field. The photos show what these strip fields ditches look like on the ground. So you can see in that top image the very pale ditch there. Uh, that's the that's one of those that's one of the strip field boundaries being cut by a later ditch, and that's just a typical uh, slot through one of them, showing how narrow and shallow they were. So following on from the strip fields, a series of ditches and enclosures were, enclosures were gradually added to create a more complex field system but with clear reference to the strip fields. There was some uh, variation in the size of these enclosure ditches, but most were large, with all of those on the, on the drier contours to the west being uh, several metres wide and over one and a half metres in depth, as you can see in, this, uh, in the bottom photograph. By combining the radiocarbon dates uh, with the relationships between the ditches, we get a clear sense of how the, how the field system developed. And actually, following the strip fields, the area of field system in the north uh, developed first, with the, the fields in the south coming slightly later. So you can see in this in the in phase 3.2, beginning in the north, and then phase 3.3, uh, that system develops, and the system in the south uh, is constructed. And there are several uh, radiocarbon dates from the north, which which start around 1500 BC opposed to the south, where they're about 1450 BC. Once a time difference uh, can be recognised, it's possible to see that the layouts are also quite different. In the north, there are complete enclosures, and they have almost an organic development, I think more affected by the topography there, particularly by uh, a paleo channel, which extended north to south through the area. In the south, the system is, is more rectilinear, um, with a sense of, of openness, perhaps, to some of the fields. The reasons behind these differences uh, may be quite straightforward. These are probably two different groups or extended families in the two locations, each, uh, respecting, each responding to the needs of their community and to different natural and topographical features. And crucially, within each area of field system, uh, there was evidence of settlement. Within the northern group of enclosures were at least three Post built structures, you see marked there, on the slightly higher, higher, drier contours. Although the main evidence for settlement was an exceptional amount of midden material coming from the upper fill of a ditch here in the enclosure to the east of where the structures were found, uh, and this being in the wetter area to the east of the Paleo Channel. So the midnight waste included around four kilograms of Deverell Rimbury pottery, including some, some examples of, of fine ware. There was 20 kilograms of animal bone, which was dominated by cattle, as was the assemblage generally across the site. 10 kilograms of struck flint, and this was convincingly later Bronze Age flint work and therefore contemporary with the settlement. A similar amount of burnt flint, several worked bone points, such as needles and gouges used in leather working and items of metalwork, including this lovely uh, side-looped and socketed spearhead, 
and this unusual item that looks uh, like a moustache and is thought to be a scabbard shaped for a sword. And this is not a unique item. There are approximately 60 of these so-called moustache objects uh, with a particular concentration in the east and southeast of England. We don't know for sure that the structures that uh, go with the waste, that the, that the structures go with the waste that was found 100 metres to the east, but it would be strange not to link the two as these are the closest structures. And what this does imply though is that all of the domestic rubbish was being deliberately removed from the domestic area and transported to the adjacent enclosure. And I should add, mention that there, there was hardly any finds from the structures or any of the ditches nearby. Although you know three of the uh, three of the structures did have uh, Middle Bronze Age radiocarbon dates, so we, you know, and they sit within the western side of this enclosure, so confident about the date, but hardly any finds associated with them. The southern southern settlement was slightly different in that the finds were spread uh, more widely around the system of enclosures, but the main settlement focus was within a large D-shaped enclosure, which contained at least two structures. You can see one there and the second on the western side of the enclosure, a number of wells and water holes, and again a concentration of midden light material in the top of the western enclosure ditch over here. The amounts weren't as large as in the north, but there was still around two kilograms of pottery from the entire enclosure, five kilograms of animal bone, struck flint, heated sandstones. A polished bone gouge and an amber bead, um, and other finds from the surrounding ditch included another spearhead and fragments of a metal working mould for a blade. Given the high number of radiocarbon dates we have from Clay Farm, it's worth showing the model here. The set at the bottom are for the northern settlement, and those above are the southern settlement. And you can see a slightly earlier inception and use of the uh, northern settlement with most dates grouped between around 1500 and 1300 BC compared to the south, which is more like 1400 to 1250. Burial is another aspect of the clay farm settlements. Associated with the northern settlement was a cemetery of 37 cremation burials, all unearned and in inhumation as well, placed into the ditch of the early Bronze Age barrow. We had we have seven radiocarbon dates from the cremations, and these fit with the dates from the northern settlement. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that the extended family who were building the structures to the north, who were constructing the field system and middening all of that material uh, into the ditch, were being buried in this cemetery just to the south. There was also a crouched inhumation to the north of the cemetery, and then across the site, a recurring trend across the Middle Bronze Age features was the presence of human bone fragments, particularly skulls in ditches and pits. There were 10 instances of such, de uh, de such deposition in total, representing at least eight adults, including two skull fragments from the northern enclosures and a further four skull fragments from the south. There was also exceptional environmental evidence from the site, particularly in the northern settlement, where the spine of the enclosure system followed and uh, cut through the course of the Paleo Channel, because of the waterlogged conditions here, particularly in the ditch seen in the, in the photo, plant ma macrofossils, pollen and insects all survived, and there was also charred, plant, uh, charred seeds from elsewhere. Waterlogged seeds associated with boundaries and disturbed ground were dominated by nettles, elder and thistles, all of which probably grew alongside the ditches. Uh, the elder could have formed hedgerows and in fact charred uh, elder seeds were found in Middle Bronze Age ditches across the whole site, to the extent that it became almost a signature for the period. The likelihood of elder seeds coming from shrubs growing along the ditch margins was also confirmed by very high levels of elder pollen in the waterlogged dip. Both the pollen in, in, and insect remains indicated uh, that the ditches ran through open grazed grassland. There were plants associated with arable land, uh, but the lack of arable indicators in the insect in the insect assemblage and the absence of waterlogged cereal remains and cereal pollen suggests arable fields were present in the wider landscape, but that the areas directly adjacent to the ditches were instead inhabited by livestock. This is evident from those plant, list, uh, plant species listed 
previously, so nettles, elder and thistles, which grow in soil that has been nutrient enriched by livestock, um, as well as from dung beetles found in the waterlogged ditch and whipworm eggs found in the pollen samples from the same ditch. This is a type of parasite which is associated with dung. So a lot of this evidence points towards a local environment that is perhaps not surprising, but being able to demonstrate it through different strands of environmental evidence is more unusual for a site of this day. I'll expand a little on the fawn remains as the keeping of livestock the livestock was clearly a key function of the site economy, as is often the case in the Middle Bronze Age. The assemblage was, was large, with cattle making up about 60% overall. The, uh, this just shows the distribution uh, across the two settlement areas of cattle bone. And as you can see, most comes from the field ditches, uh, perhaps notably also where the midden areas uh, were. So in the north, that's in the, the midden ditch there. And in, here's the settlement enclosure in the south. The cattle remains suggest a strategy geared to more than simply meat production, with cattle also exploited for milk and traction. Similarly, remains of sheep suggested that they were killed between second and six years of age, indicating use for wool and milk as well as meat. Um, combined with the environmental results, we get a strong picture of the pastoral economy within these settlements or farmsteads. Finally, I'll just come back to the wider landscape, to the settlement and field system I mentioned earlier at, at the AstraZeneca and Papworth Hospital site on the eastern side of the valley. There isn't uh, time to go into too much detail about it now, but it's a very, another very impressive set of enclosures and settlement remains with uh, substantial uh, triple ditches around part of the system. And as at Clay Farm, there was uh, evidence for early strip fields, structures inside the enclosures and areas of middening again. What this landscape shows then is a real intensity of occupation and land use throughout the Middle Bronze Age, with the addition of quite exceptional settlement remains. And each of the three main settlements are different in certain respects, which is not surprisingly, as not surprising as they were probably constructed and farmed by different groups of pe people. Therefore, it's not surprising that the, pattern, that the pattern is also different in the Cam Valley from the sites I mentioned in Norfolk. And in fact, it's different in the Cam Valley from other areas of Cambridgeshire. And while all of these sites do share a Middle Bronze Age signature, they also display variability. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand over to Alex Davies, who is going to speak about Wallingford in Oxfordshire. So I'm going to talk about two sites on the outskirts of Wallingford in South Oxfordshire, Slade End Farm and Winterbrook. I'm going to describe these sites, focusing on the landscape enclosure and human remains, while touching on themes of regional diversity. Just to show a bit of context, uh, here's the Thames with Wallingford uh, between Oxford and Reading. We're close to the Goring Gap, separating the Upper Thames from the Middle Thames. These excavations are part of a series of sites, mainly in advance of housing development, as the town of Wallingford expands to the west. This is throwing up a lot of archaeological work, which is developing all the time, so ideas about wider landscape are provisional. This map shows about two dozen excavations and evaluations in and around Wallingford. Uh, this field here is Slade End Farm and Winterbrook down here. These other sites vary in size, uh, but there are a series of large evaluations around the Ring Road as the town is expanding. So New Barn Farm down here, which is being excavated at the moment. The Winterbrook West is this field. Um, and Hintercroft Farm is here. The sites I'm talking about, Slade End Farm, and Winterbrook are about a kilometre and a half away from each other. The opened excavation area at Slade End Farm is about 19 and a half hectares and Winterbrook one and a half hectares. Both sites have a wealth of prehistoric remains alongside the Middle Bronze Age, Neolithic pits, burials and a Penanula mon monument, and Iron Age settlements and pit alignments. Although interestingly, neither of the sites had Late Bronze Age or Late Iron Age evidence and it appears there was a significant break in occupation um, at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. This is Slade End Farm. 
it's not the typical coaxial system that characterizes the sites further down the Thames Valley, like Heathrow, Terminal 5, and others in that landscape. Nor is it really a agglomerate collection of enclosures. Instead, the system is defined by these two major trackways or droveways, with a number of usually two or three sided enclosures coming off either the main trackway or elsewhere in the landscape. There's clearly been some truncation and destruction of elements with partial ditches like these, this being remnants of further enclosures. Even so, it's not the co a coaxial landscape. But the number of these partial open three, two or three sided enclosures does make it clear that these are genuine features and recall the L-shaped ditches widely found across southern Britain. Maybe clearer if I zoom. No certain roundhouses were found or even post holes, despite the sizable open area that was clearly all in use during the Middle Bronze Age. These here are Iron Age roundhouses, and there are plenty of Iron Age post holes and post built roundhouses, so they should have survived. The lack of roundhouses is a bit of a theme in the area, and the large number of sites in the Middle Thames that typically don't have Middle Bronze Age roundhouses. With an absence of structural evidence, we can try and use the distribution of pottery, charcoal and burnt stone at highlighting areas that may have been settlement or may have been agricultural. This is a heat map showing distribution of pottery. This shows the density of pot pottery calculated by a cubic metre of excavated material in each slot. Interpreting this isn't straightforward, but along with the charcoal and burnt stone, five possible settlement areas can be suggested, some more convincing than others. 13% of the ditches were attributed to one of these settlements. Just over half the pottery was from these slots, as well as 40% of the charcoal rich fills and all of the fills with burnt stone. The non-settlement ditches produced 31 grams of pottery per cubic metre, with the settlements between 58 grams, which is this one, which obviously is quite tentative to interpret as a settlement, and 1500 grams per cubic metre. So you can see on this graph the um, density of, of pottery across these five potential settlement areas against other ditches. The possible settlements varied a lot in size, from 200 metres squared to 1600 metres squared. If you group the enclosures into rectangular, subrectangular, and L shaped, none of the possible settlements are rectangular. It may be that the regular rectangular elements were agricultural. Uh, the clearest are these area up here. And pottery from this area was particularly scarce in the northern area. Six cremation burials were found. These were all quite small and had clearly been truncated, usually about 40 centimetres wide and 15 centimetres deep. Although they were in the same area of the site as the enclosure, spatially they don't really respect each other. The cremations are found inside or outside the enclosure, inside the trackway or driveway around, as well as cutting the trackway ditch. So it's not clearly an enclosure to enclose a, an area of, of cremations. Two more cremation burials were found in the southern part of the site. Both of these are in situ busting types, where the uh, cremations, where the pyre appears to have been built above the open pit. The rim of the pits and upper part of the natural was scorched red. The base was not burned in this way, and the, pit, the pits were full of charcoal and burnt bone. The other main Middle Bronze Age feature at Slade End Farm was a water hole with an in situ log ladder. The water hole was up to four metres across and two metres deep. The lower and middle fills were recut multiple times, with this part being left to silt up, although the upper part looked to have been backfilled. The excavation at Winterbrook was much smaller, and we don't get the same picture of landscape use and enclosure as at Slade End Farm. A single square enclosure was found in the centre of the excavation area, about 85 metres across. There is some evidence potential, potentially that this was part of a wider system with these ditches and maybe that one beyond the main enclosure. But there was nothing clear to the south of the evaluation uh, that suggests that this was part of a, a much of a bigger enclosed coaxial landscape. There are a series of 
internal ditches and enclosures that are at least of two phases. The most significant discovery at the site was six inhumations and two groups of articulated human remains in the main enclosure ditch. No separate cuts were clearly found, and it appears that all were buried in the enclosure ditch, probably at a similar time. Five of the inhumations and two groups of bones were found in this ditch on the southwest side next to each other. The other burial is in the northwest ditch. Both adults and adolescents are represented, males and female. The inhumations were of varying levels of preservation, but do display some um, interesting features. Two of them are very tightly contracted. If you look at this one, the humerus and radius. The humerus and radius are parallel to each other, and the tibia and femur are also almost parallel to each other. This suggests that they were very tightly bound, even such that decomposition may have occurred when they were wrapped to allow for this tight contraction. This is the other very tightly crouched individual. Other oddities are this one. This skeleton, um, the only element below the vertebrae uh, is this femur, placed unnaturally overlying the left humerus. The burial has clearly been disturbed. Perhaps the other leg and feet bones were removed. One of the inhumations was also buried with an articulated finger belonging to a different individual, and a disarticulated vertebra of a child was found with another inhumation. One of the individuals was buried prone, and another undated but probably Middle Bronze Age a burial at the site was also prone. Three of the burials have been radiocarbon dated. Two are consistent, so could have died around the same time, but one of the very tightly contracted burials died probably a century or more after the other two. Uh, this is the one on the northwest side of the enclosure, away from the other burials, and a recut was seen in a different slot, which might explain a later date. Either way, it seems likely here that we have evidence of some practices that are not just the burial of recently de deceased individuals. There may be burial some time after death, after being tightly wrapped or digging up of old burials and redepositing articulated and disarticulated bones. Uh, this is the sort of thing that's recently been discussed by Joe Brook and Tom Moore in Antiquity, who have shown individuals being buried some time after their death. As at Sladen Farm, there are no Middle Bronze Age houses or post holes, despite a number of Iron Age roundhouses and lots of Iron Age post holes, and just two Middle Bronze Age pits. Not much pottery was found in any of the ditches, and doing the same analysis as at Sladen Farm, uh, pottery density comes out as being less than the po possible settlements at Sladen Farm, and similar to the other background ditch assemblages. These internal ditches and enclosures may have had some agricultural use. We have three radiocarbon dates from the cremations and three from the inhumations. Plotting these out, uh, this is the inhumations and these are the cremations. The inhumations start earlier and the cremations finish later. But there's certainly overlap with very similar dates from these two individuals. The Buston cremations are of a similar date. These two distributions are kernel density estimates of the dates, which basically sums them. So again, it shows that the inhumations start earlier, but then there's overlap. When you look at dates from some 55 individuals from the Upper Thames Valley at a wider scale, both cremation and inhumation were very much in use at the same time throughout the Middle Bronze Age. These dates are thanks to Chris Hayden, who collected them. These are kernel density estimates, again, of both cremations and inhumations from the Upper Thames, summing the dates. So while inhumations, this one, may actually have been more popular in the early, in the early Bronze Age compared to cremation, both rites still peak in the Middle Bronze Age and then decrease as you enter the Late Bronze Age. Okay, to change tack slightly and look at the wider Wallingford landscape in the Middle Bronze Age. As I mentioned earlier, there's much archeological work around the town in recent years with more ongoing and future work planned. Most of the sites in and around Wallingford are evaluations, some quite small, but others large, 10 or more hectares. Eight of these sites plotted out had evidence of Middle Bronze Age, but alongside, alongside Slade End Farm and Winterbrook, the only sites with good evidence of Middle Bronze Age field systems or enclosures are this one, the New Barn Farm, and probably Hintercroft Farm, which is this field here. 
Middle Bronze Age evidence at the other sites includes uh, seemingly isolated cattle burial uh, pits and waterholes, but not field systems. And although they're mainly evaluations, field systems are definitely the sort of thing uh, that are much more likely to be found uh, in evaluations and, and show themselves. Significantly, the evaluation at Winsbrook West, which is this large field, some 24 hectares next to our excavation at Winsbrook, didn't find any Middle Bronze Age evidence. So the work around Wallingford is certainly showing a landscape utilised with evidence of enclosures and trackways. But this really is somewhat different from the large coaxial systems that are found further down the Thames Valley at the more famous sites at Heathrow Terminal 5 and the many sites west of London. It's worth quickly introducing the Middle Bronze Age landscape around Didcot, only seven kilometres to the west, as actually what we're seeing here is perhaps a large singular coaxial system present across a significant area. The system was mainly seen at Great Western Park, in this corner and here, and Appleford Sidings, but picked up in other excavations around. The, the system, the ditches, share a broadly east-west, north-south alignment in all of the areas, and stretches southwest from Didcot north to the Thames, which is about five and a half kilometres, and two and a half kilometres east to west. And although this map was only made two years ago, the pace of work is such that it's already out of date with three or more sites additional to this showing the system. So really what could be considered as one landscape, that between Didcot and Wallingford, seven or eight kilometres away from each other, and on the gravels and green sands south of the Thames, we're getting quite a different picture of landscape use. A large coaxial field system around and north of Didcot, familiar to those who know the west of London sites, but just seven kilometres or so in Wallingford, we have an area that's clearly used at the same time with enclosures and some trackways, but not the large divided coaxial system as at Didcot. This is one of the themes that the seminar is highlighting, the amount of diversity in the Middle Bronze Age, not only in regions previously little understood, but even those that are thought to have been known. We have differences in landscapes, in landscape use just locally and some very divergent burial rites. So thanks for listening, and I think we are moving on to Somerset with Leo Webley next. Thanks, Alex. So we now move westwards to Somerset. The Bronze Age of Somerset is well known for its metalwork, particularly from the Middle Bronze Age, and for the trackways and other wetland sites in the levels. Understanding of Bronze Age settlement, meanwhile, has until recently been very poor compared to neighbouring areas such as Wessex and Devon and Cornwall. Just in the last couple of years, though, development-led archaeology has dramatically changed the picture with the excavation of a number of Middle Bronze Age settlement sites. Today, I will discuss three Middle Bronze Age settlements excavated by Oxford Archaeology at sites located on the lowland dry ground fringing the southern Somerset levels and moors. Two of these, at Chedden, Fitzpain and Alla, were small-scale excavations that uncovered single enclosures, comparable to some that have now been found at other sites in Somerset. By contrast, the larger excavation at Bridgewater Gateway uncovered a much more extensive settlement complex, suggesting that something rather different was going on here. This site was located on a gravel island about one kilometre long, which you can make out here, surrounded by wetland deposits. And it's thought that there was a transition from freshwater marsh to salt marsh conditions during the course of the Bronze Age. We already know quite a bit about the archaeology of this island due to the work of the Lost Islands of Somerset project. Almost the whole island has been subject to geophysical survey, revealing four ring ditches and a number of enclosures. Test excavation and radiocarbon dating of two of the ring ditches confirmed an early Bronze Age date while a larger sub-rectangular enclosure at the southern end of the island was dated to the latter stages of the Middle Bronze Age. This provides a context for the excavations carried out by OA in advance of development at the northern end of the island. Following evaluation, excavation was targeted on two enclosures identified in the geophysical survey, a small square one here and a larger trapezoidal one here. The small square enclosure 
turned out to be another early Bronze Age funerary monument containing three cremation burials. That was a real surprise, as a square barrow or square funerary enclosure from the early Bronze Age is pretty much without parallel. The larger enclosure was 44 metres across. Unfortunately, it couldn't be radiocarbon dated, but the associated Trevisca related pottery demonstrates a Middle Bronze Age date. This has more of a domestic feel, with fragments of cylindrical fired clay loom weights recovered, as well as the pottery. The interior of the enclosure contained clusters of post holes and pits that probably represent structures, although no clear house plans can be discerned. At the entrance of the enclosure, a cattle burial had been interred to mark the threshold. So we can see a sequence of landscape use on this island in the levels. A group of funerary monuments dotted along the central spine of the island was established and developed through the course of the earlier Bronze Age. Then during the Middle Bronze Age, two settlement enclosures were established, 800 metres apart at either end of the island. Our second site is at Nerrell's Farm, Chedden Fitzpane. This site is situated a bit further inland on the slopes of the valley of the River Tone. Again, we have early Bronze Age activity here in the form of a small ring ditch. This may well have been a funerary monument, although no burials survive. Just to the south of this was the substantial Middle Bronze Age enclosure that you see here. This was 44 metres across and had two phases. The second phase enclosure ditch produced much Trevisca related pottery, and a sequence of radiocarbon dates shows that the ditch filled during the 14th century Cal BC. Within the enclosure is a probable roundhouse and also a series of pots buried standing upright in the ground, seven in total, including five from within the roundhouse. And these I'll return to in a minute. There were no Middle Bronze Age features outside the enclosure, but there is evidence for activity in this period in the wider landscape. This includes another similar Middle Bronze Age enclosure, recently excavated by another organisation just over one kilometre away at Moncton Heathfield. Other than pottery, finds were limited. There was though a fragment of a fired clay metalworking mould, probably used for casting a rapier. This is the first Middle Bronze Age bronze casting evidence recovered from an excavated site in Somerset. Unfortunately, no bone survived the harsh soil, but chemical analysis of the pottery showed that most showed traces of milk fats. This suggests that dairying was an important element of the economy. Our final site is Bridgewater Gateway, which lies to the south of the town of Bridgewater. The seven hectare site is located on a low spur or peninsula, which you can make out here, lying just to the south of the lower lying Stock Moor, which is thought to have been a salt marsh during the Bronze Age. The site appears to have been sporadically occupied in the later Neolithic and early Bronze Age, as shown by clusters of pits. But in the Middle Bronze Age, a more substantial complex of enclosures and other features was laid out, extending over more than 450 metres. In the central part of the site here, a series of conjoined enclosures was laid out in a row, with a further L-shaped enclosure to the north. To the south, they are trackway, with two conjoining enclosures. And adjacent to the trackway also was a ring ditch, next to which lay a cemetery. And the complex may in fact have continued beyond the limits of our excavation, as recent work by another organisation has found yet another Middle Bronze Age enclosure 400 metres to the east at Dawes Farm. Radiocarbon dating suggests that the funerary area may have been established first, in the first half of the Middle Bronze Age. This comprised a ring ditch six metres in diameter, with a group of 68 pits placed alongside it. Only one of the pits contained a substantial earned cremation burial. Around 40 other features were simple pits containing only token amounts of cremated bone. Another pit contained a large urn, which in turn contained a smaller vessel, but no bone, while a further pit contained the smashed remains of a decorated pot. The radiocarbon dates from the settlement are very consistent with each other and overlap with those from the funerary area, but with a slightly later emphasis. There are no stratigraphic relationships between the conjoining enclosures, and only one of the enclosures shows evidence for the recutting of its ditch. So it may be that the settlement complex is basically all of one phase, 
and was perhaps only occupied for a generation or two. Four roundhouses were evident, two in one enclosure, one in another, and one outside the enclosures. Finds included more than 40 kilograms of pottery in the Trevisca related style, by some distance the largest Middle Bronze Age assemblage from the Somerset settlement. Petrological analysis has suggested that all of the sample vessels could have been locally made. Numerous fragments of loom weights suggest that textile working was important. The charred plant remains show an emphasis on cereals, especially barley. Again, though, unfortunately, no animal bones survived. There's some evidence for zoning of activities across the site. Distribution of pottery and cereal remains clearly shows that domestic occupation was most intensive in the two enclosures in the central part of the site that contained roundhouses. Loom weights had a wider distribution, though, and at Chedd and Fitzpain, there are a number of sunken pots across the site, some of these occurring in enclosures that didn't appear to contain buildings. So while not all the enclosures were lived in, it may be a bit too simplistic to conclude that the others were just paddocks for livestock. The sunken pots found at Bridgewater Gateway and Chedden and Fitzpain deserve further consideration. Similar buried pots have often been found at Middle Bronze Age sites, especially in the southwest. Those from our sites were typically large, thick-walled jars. All have been truncated, and in some cases, only the very base survive which raises the question of whether they were originally set into the ground with their rims flush with or protruding above the ground surface. As we have seen, some of the pots were located within roundhouses. These pots could be interpreted in different ways. The problem is illustrated within the house at Chen Fitzpain by a sequence in which one sunken pot was subsequently truncated by the deposition of the second. Now it could be that the first pot was buried as an offering within the house, perhaps to mark its construction. And at a later point in the history of the building, the inhabitants rededicated the same spot with a second pot. This second pot may have been specially chosen, as it has a rare form of decoration, with the inside of the base of the pot decorated with a cross, ornamented with rows of fingertip impressions. Alternatively, the first pot may have been a fixture within the house used for storage of foodstuffs or water, which at some point needed to be replaced. This second pot may seem incongruous as a storage vessel, as the unusual decoration on the base would have been covered up by whatever was contained in the vessel. But this could perhaps have been something quite powerful, if the decoration was usually hidden, but revealed at certain times to certain people. Whichever interpretation we follow, it's clear that at some point, the second pot was then filled with stones, including heat-shattered quartz and a large fragment of a quern made of rock, probably from Cornwall. This could have been a deliberate closure deposit, perhaps associated with the formal abandonment of the house. So to sum up, present evidence suggests that most known Middle Bronze Age settlements in Somerset consisted of a single, modestly sized enclosure, as we've seen at Alla and Shedden Fitzpain. Often, these were placed only a kilometre or so from other enclosures. This could suggest a dense pattern of settlement within some local landscapes. Although more work is needed to establish whether these enclosures were directly contemporary with each other, or rather represent a single group that shifted around the landscape over time. A larger complex of enclosures, trackway and cemetery at Bridgewater Gateway suggests a different situation. Here perhaps the community was constituted differently. One thing that we so far lack from any excavated sites in Somerset is evidence for the extensive coaxial field systems that are so common in many other parts of southern Britain. This could suggest a differing system of land tenure. Also notable is that while many of these sites were close to the wetland edge, they've produced little evidence for the use of wetland resources. Presumably the marsh was used for seasonal grazing, but beyond that, were these basically dryland communities that just happened to be near the wetland. We've seen that none of our sites shows evidence for late Bronze Age activity. In fact, the radiocarbon dates from our sites and from other Middle Bronze Age enclosures in Somerset show a strong clustering in the middle part of the period, around the 14th to early 13th century Cal BC. That's interesting, as in exactly the same period, the so-called Taunton metalworking phase, 
Somerset became a focus for the deposition of a number of major metalwork hordes. Perhaps these were two sides of the same coin, with communities feeling a need to express their identity at this time, both through making major offerings of metalwork and through constructing substantial enclosures. The social developments that may have caused this remain to be investigated. Many thanks for listening. I shall now hand over to Carl Champness, who will take us to Sussex. Hi, I'm Carl Champness. I'm a senior project manager at Oxford Archaeology, and today I'm going to be talking about briefly about a project we recently completed back in February at Cross Levels Way in Eastbourne in East Sussex. Uh, the site has produced evidence of middle to late Bronze Age settlement and some interesting artefact concentrations. The site is located within East Sussex College playing fields, located along the A228, known also as Cross Levels Way in Eastbourne. The Hospice of St Wilfrid's is located just to the south and the College Athletic Track to the west. Uh, the site was being undertaken as part of preliminary works for the new primary school. You can see the boundary of the evaluation area is indicated in red and the remains of our previous evaluation that was undertaken in August 2019. The site is located just off the Willingdon Levels, which is an area of low-lying wetlands which was dominated by a tidal embayment up until land reclamation during the medieval period. It occupies an outcrop of gold clay that overlooks the levels, providing elevated views over the former wetlands. The site is a complex geology of jelly-fluctuated chalk and glacial fluval sands and gravel deposits which underlie the site. Evidence of thin alluvial and peat deposits have previously been identified at the evaluation of St Wilfrid's Hospice to the south. The nationally important Late Bronze Age Lake Village platform of Shinewater is located to the north of the site, crossing the Willenden Levels. Several other Late Bronze Age trackways have also been identified, crossing the Willingdon and Pevensey Levels. Potential of the site was first identified within the death base assessment that considered the potential for early archaeological remains to be found at the edge of the levels, sealed underneath alluvial or colluvial deposits. 18 trenches were initially proposed and excavated across the site in August 2019. The evaluation revealed a late prehistoric landscape of field system ditches, enclosures, pits, post holes, trackway and a possible roundhouse. Disturbed lithic scatters were recorded within the subsoil but did not reveal any in situ material. A significant concentration of later prehistoric lithic and pottery was recovered from the features. Uh, a possible buried soil was also investigated, um, but no pottery or in situ lithic material was recovered. The evaluation was completed in good weather conditions, and the archaeology was clearly visible against the underlying geology. Some 233 sherds of pottery weighing 1.1 kilograms were recovered from across the evaluation. Half of this material derived from the subsoil. The majority of material dates to the Middle to Late Bronze Age. Most of the, sh the sherds were of coarse flint fabric and showed affinities to regional devil rimbury forms. However, none of the vessels were very clearly of this style, and there were a number of thinner walled vessels that might be more comfortably within the early post-devil rimbury tradition. It is likely that many of the flint-tempered assemblage belongs broadly to a single period, and this appears to be the latter part of the devil rimbury tradition and early part of the post-devil rimbury tradition, around 1250 1, to 1000 Cal BC. In late October to early November 2019, we returned to the site as part of the mitigation phase. Twenty one metre by one metre hand dug test pits were excavated to investigate the lithics within the subsoil. A complex sequence of subsoil and potential archaeological deposits were identified, including the recovery of significant lithic assemblage from the upper subsoil. This was overlying a further sterile deposit, sealing archaeological horizon. On average, as many as 250 pieces of work flint were recovered per test pit, alongside several hundred burnt fragments and up to 20 pottery sherds were covered in total. Flint work included numerous pieces of napping waste, indicative of an industrial site, and contained a wide range of cores, tools and blanks of various periods. Based on the initial interpretation and assessment of the lithic assemblage recovered from the test pits, these were not considered to be in situ, but rather redeposited material that was most likely re brought into the area ne from nearby construction work during the levelling up of the playing fields. As the test pit shows, you can see a very thin topsoil deposit overlying by quite a depth of subsoil. 
the upper subsoil deposit clearly had an indi a concentration of rework lithic material and also middle to late Bronze Age pottery. Below this was a very sterile deposit that contained none of that material, and this was overlying our archaeological horizon. Following the completion of the test pits, the subsoils were removed by machine under archaeological supervision. The main excavation of the site was undertaken between November 2019 and March 2020, which revealed a multi-period landscape of enclosure ditches. Conditions were challenging over winter and the site was frequently flooded. A series of multi-phase enclosures can be seen on the plan above. This can be seen as our initial middle to late Bronze Age rectangular enclosure with a clear driveway or trackway coming in from the north, a whole series of post structures and pit around that and our three potential artifact scatters that also appear to be of mid to late Bronze Age in date. There was then a Roman or slightly later uh, trackway that goes right across the site off towards the Willingdon levels and then a much later phase of uh, field system ditches that go northwest to southeast. If we take a closer look at the middle Bronze Age enclosure, we can see there's potentially structures within the, the enclosure. We've got clearly one structure just up here. We've got another one associated with our trackway and one of our larger spreads, which is sort of 25 metres by 20 metres. And we've got a whole series of post structures located at, just at the edge of the enclosure where we've got a slight break in that enclosure ditch. Um, the two main artefact spreads um, also produced quite a high concentration of both late prehistoric lithic material and also middle to late Bronze Age pottery. There was no other dating evidence um, that would suggest areas of contamination. And so there was suggestion whether these were properly in situ buried surfaces or whether they represented midden type deposits. The photo shows you one of our Middle Bronze Age structures. You can see it's a post structure with a clear entranceway with much deeper posts at the entranceway. Uh, you can see one of our excavators cleaning that surface in quite bad and wet conditions and a pot just right in front of them that was on the surface. Fresh looking lithic and unabraded pottery was recovered from the three artefact spreads that were identified during the excavation work. These were initially gridded into five meter grids, which were then subdivided into one meter by one meter grids to look for any in situ material associated with potentially buried soils. 24 initial test pits were excavated and sampled as part of this initial phase of investigation. 165 pottery sherds were recovered from these test pits and again all consistent with a middle bronze age date. Um, 419 lithics were recovered and recovered from the western scatter and 230 were recovered from the larger middle section. Unfortunately there was a long delay from the end of the main excavation and the initial investigation phases um, to actually return into site to actually undertake the full investigation of these artefact scatters. This was partly due to the Covid lockdown and also to other issues like land access and the expense associated with such work. Um, eventually, once they were all resolved, the excavation of the spreads were undertaken between November 2020 and February 2021. Um, we identified potential uh, in situ lithic material and a reasonable collection of middle to late Bronze Age pottery were clearly found associated with each of the scatters, along with other material. Unfortunately, the delay in getting back to site to undertake the full um, excavation of the grid squares meant that we were excavating the artefact scatters in the middle of winter and as you can see from this photo uh, undertaking excavations at the edge of the Willingdon levels over winter is not always the best idea and the staff did a great job of actually continuing in some very tough conditions. As you can see from the this plot of the flint and uh, pottery from the main scatter you can see a high concentration of um, pottery in the green and also the flint in the yellow. Um, you can see a clear concentration of pottery in this area and this co uh, coincided with a subsurface hollow which effectively had a deep uh, organic base to it that potentially could represent a, a buried 
uh, soil or deposit um, which seem to have the richest concentration of material. You can also see unfortunately we lost the middle section which our evaluation trench had gone through and obviously had disturbed part of the flints. As you can see from this photo uh, this is a section through the subsurface hollow. You can see a clear organic base to the sequence um, that potentially had a much higher concentration of lithic material and this is the potential in situ buried soil that was mentioned earlier. Obviously there was flints overlying that associated with probably other further activity or infilling of this hollow. Um, the analysis and the samples are still away to be processed until we really do the full analysis uh, on the flints and also the pottery. Um, this question of whether it is a truly in situ surface, whether we can identify in situ material, will we really wait, have to wait till the post excavation work has been completed? So thanks very much, Carl, for that presentation. Um, that is obviously at a rather earlier stage than um, uh, some of the others we've heard about today, but it was nonetheless interesting to hear about uh, those very interesting uh, uh, midden deposits uh, and artifacts concentrations. So we now move on to the uh, live um, panel discussion, which will bring in some of the questions that, that uh, people have been submitting through the course of the seminar. Uh, please do continue to post questions in the, the Q&A box if you can, uh, and we'll try to get around to some of them in the course of the discussion. We're very pleased to welcome to our discussion panel four distinguished prehistorians, uh, Jackie Novakovsky, Amarin Cooper, Robert Johnson, uh, and the panel chair, John Barrett. Uh, and I'll now hand over to John. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm just negotiating my way around this. I see we have a question from, or a comment from Peter Chan. I mean, can I say initially that we've heard so much material that it's taking a while for it all to sink in, I think. And quite remarkably, this material is, well, varied, it's dense. Um, I deprecate the use of the term Middle Bronze Age and, and Early Bronze Age. I don't think we, we know anymore what these terms mean. It seems to me that we're looking at an organic development which is taking place through um, around 1700, later into about 1400 BC radiocarbon time. So I, I, don't, I don't think any longer we can talk about this kind of firm division of a Bronze Age. While well, I read the next question, are there any comments from our other panelists, Alan Cooper or, or Bob Johnson or anybody else want to comment on what we've seen? Because I'm, I'm having a difficulty taking it all in, I must admit. I took lots of notes. So there was lots of really good stuff there. And I think those ditched enclosures are just something else. And they don't seem to me to be well, I haven't seen anything like that before. The only thing that really resonated with me was um, Leo's uh, Somerset site with the Trevisca and truncated pots and the Bridgewater Gateway. Yeah. Um, I have to say that that cross face that you saw of the one of the truncated Tre Trevisca pots, there are at least two examples of that decoration that I can think of in Cornwall, both from early Bronze Age deposits, as well as pots in pots as well. So anyway. Very much southwest tradition, if you like. Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, I think Somerset's in quite an interesting place in this period because it does have those very clear connections uh, with with uh, some of the sites you've worked on in, in in Cornwall. You know, very clear connections with the southwest peninsula in terms of some of the the, the features of the ceramics, as you say, uh, the, the pots buried in the ground, the sort of the, the heat shattered quartz placed in one of those pots. I mean, these are all things we can see in some of the Cornish settlements. Um, but also, you know, there are there are similarities with what's going on um, further east as well. I mean, the pottery is not classic Trevisca ware, as, as you know, it, it's this Trevisca related ware, which does also show some similarities with um, uh, the Devil Rimbury traditions um, further to the east. Uh, and I think in other ways as well, some of these sites, some of these settlements do show some similarities with, with um, some of the sites you can see further to the east in, in Wessex and so on. So it, it's got this sort of quite interesting sort of transitional uh, uh, placement, I, I think. Um, okay. I should say as well that they're, they're, they're not my sites. Um, I, I didn't excavate any of these sites or even manage any of them, so um, I, I do have to give credit to, to the people who did. But yeah. 
I, I'm concerned about the lack of roundhouses on some of these sites and the degree of truncation, which is implied, and the idea of truncation perhaps being indicated by both the sunken vessels, but also about the existence of this spread of material, which we're seeing in Sussex, which presumably is just an indication of survival, that actually the truncation must, might be much greater on these sites than is being allowed. Um, do the experts just want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, I'm not too overly concerned about the lack of roundhouses and it being a, um, a feature of truncation. I mean, although certainly all of these sites are truncated to a greater or lesser degree on these um, heavily ploughed areas, certainly at Slade End Farm and Winterbrook, where we didn't get any Middle Bronze Age houses, we did get plenty of Iron Age houses and Iron Age post holes. Um, so I think that if the Iron Age post holes survived, perhaps the Middle Bronze Age ones should have. I think maybe this is actually a, a theme which you're seeing elsewhere further down the Thames Valley, is not, not very many Middle Bronze Age roundhouses. And sort of as you were commenting that perhaps the development from the early to Middle Bronze Age is organic and not, and not absolute, maybe the lack of roundhouses is, is part of that organic development you're getting. You're still not getting the roundhouses in some areas, um, and maybe that's a, a, a feature that continues on from the early Bronze Age, despite this, there being um, visible enclosures. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, the, I think the truncation can be heavy on some sites and the fact that any of these post post-built structures survive is is, is amazing really i mean the, you know you get the big ditches and the deep pits but post holes can be so shallow what's left um if you get them great but if not then as alex demonstrated on his site you know you look the sort of distributions of fines as, as an indicator for where people were and where the occupation was do you have any, do the excavators have any control over levels of, of truncation on your site at all? I was thinking this became a very big issue at Terminal 5, for example. Well, well very, very slight, I suppose, you know, I mean, do the best as possible to, to get to the, to the, to the very horizon of the deposit, to the, the features, but I mean, you, you know, you would see them if they, if they were there. It's just, uh, you know, they, they just have not survived really. And when you, when you sort of assume that all of the floor, you know, any uh, original floor layers that had gone with the structures are entirely gone and whatever post holes are left, so few finds to come from them. Um, yeah, I think it's just gone. All right. You know your Bell Farm site that had the, the ditch? I mean, that ditch was quite a, a very wide ditch, wasn't it? It's two metres. Yeah. It was very deep. Um, did you have any evidence for an, a bank or anything that anything on you know on the interior side? And then you've got yeah, you got yeah. the sorry. And then you've got the post alignments, which you said were very regularly spaced, and they look like very good good evidence. That combination of wood and ditch, and it was a very unusual kind of arrangement. I thought you know, and it sort of showed respect, but it also showed some kind of variation in terms of architectural features you know with the compounds you said there was a two round a roundhouse in each distinct compound wasn't there this, that was yeah yeah i mean it is, it's a it's a it's a, an, a incredible site really i mean just the look of it um it just takes a lot of thinking about to try and work out how long it was in use for um what the sequence was and the truncation issue there as well i mean it's i mean it's very was there was there a big truncation issue there? Because you got well, the alignments. I think the fact that they, yeah, exactly. The fact that they seem to survive so well um, without gaps and things, I think they have survived. But how deep they were originally, of course, it's hard to say. It's very sandy soil there. Um, my feeling is that the, the, the posts couldn't have been too tall, really, just because in that ground you would need such large post holes. I mean, obviously they could have been low. Um, soil banks almost that they were that they were built into perhaps that have, have all gone um but yeah they have you know the impressions that what's left of those post holes despite being only about um sort of 20 centimeters deep have survived quite uniformly across the site and, and i don't i don't think that the sequence there either i don't 
although it must span part of the Middle Bronze Age, um, I, it, it looks as if that there isn't, there's such one of the questions asked about um, whether there's any evidence of replacement or maintenance of these post alignments. Not really. I mean, they, they seem, you know, one phase really, um, each alignment. So how long would they have stood for? Perhaps each phase, you know, you'd think a generation or so before some of those posts would need replacing. Perhaps they have been replaced. Uh, um, but you can't see the evidence of the maintenance. Um, and, but I'm going, and then the ditch itself. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good size. Uh, but, you know, again, the other side, Clay Farm, the ditches were, were, were huge in places there, several metres across and one and a half metres deep. So. Um, and you asked, and they said about the banks as well. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the the Bell Farm bank, I think, was on the on the interior. Um, again, just because there was a lack of features just on the interior, whereas obviously you've got some of the post alignments right on the outside. Um, so and we that can envisage, trench, so we can envis envisage that they they're not just open ditches. They yeah, they are banked. They are a statement of intent. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. A yeah. visible statement in the landscape. So you're making you're making place then. Yes, I think so. Certainly, an element of it is 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 a sort of statement. Yes, um, for the community that have constructed and, and, and live there. Yes. So I, I'm interested in this question as the density of settlement, for example. I mean, do is this indicating a very dense settlement suddenly emerging at some point in the Bronze Age, or, or I mean, I can't get a handle on how this where how this comes about. I mean, clearly we need um, much more uh, radiocarbon dating. We, we need sort of proper sequences of, of, of radiocarbon dating from as many of these sites as possible. Um, we, we try to do a little bit of that with sort of sequences of dates um, through through ditches of individual sites in order to just really try and narrow down, tie down the chronology of, of, of these sites. Um, but until we do that, you know, it, it won't be clear whether the very dense patterns of, of, of enclosures we see in areas like Somerset, whether that is literally a, a, a case of um, individual units living in some cases only a few hundred meters or a couple of kilometers apart or whether there is an element of, of shifting around in the landscape over time with a particular group moving from place to place within a micro landscape through the course of the middle bronze age i think at the moment um, we just can't really answer that question in most regions with the evidence we've got um, but of course, that's that's why Bridgewater Gateway, the site I talked about, was so interesting because here we do have what looks like a larger complex that does appear to be more or less all contemporary. So we have got, it appears, a community of a certain size there. Um, I, I don't know how that compares to some of the other regions we've been talking about today. Well, I mean, what are the economies then? Are we talking about regional economies? Are we talking about specialist pastoralism? Are we talking about agricultural? Rare economies. Where are the quernstones? I haven't heard a single mention of a quernstone today. Well, yeah, only only because there was too much to fit in fifteen minutes. So yeah, I mean, Clay Farm did have um. Oh, did I have see. It's, it's towards quernstones. <laughs> I mean, you know, not plentiful, but there were quernstones, and say, you know, evidence for, for craft activities. Um, it's a full range of full range of. Uh, uh, you know, domestic activities going on at some of these sites. Um, okay, what I mean, about in terms of grain then? What about grain? Have you been looking for grain? There's been sieving for grain? Yeah, I mean, charred, yes, charred cereals often um, often do come up. They were there at Clay Farm, not so much at Bell, Bell Farm. Um, it's variable, isn't it, I suppose, from one site to another, um, depends on the, depending on the level of preservation. Depends, but depends on the context, doesn't it? Because if you don't have floor levels in houses, which you don't seem to have, and you don't have half deposits, but you do have middens, the middens will pre presumably be full of the organic material that will give us an insight into the agrarian economy. But it seems to me that pastoralism is like, you know, a big thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's the same in the southwest, even though you might have a, a mixed economy, a husbandry economy, according to location, whether you're coastal or up the uplands or the lowlands. 
but pastoralism seems to be a big thing um, because this is why you're making, this is why you're formally, formally marking out the land all the time, aren't you? And then you're using human remains to, to legitimate land ownership and tenure, aren't you? And you're using those early Bronze Age traditions about controlling land as a social resource. Does that, does that resonate at all? Is it worth here making reference back to John's um, observation or perhaps question at the beginning about the degree to which um, the, the sort of shift from an early to a middle, both in inverted commas, Bronze Age or Bronze Ages, uh, represented anything sort of abrupt or substantial. And actually pastoralism has, has long, and particularly mobile pastoralism, has long been associated with the you know, the, the third millennium, or certainly later part of the third millennium and the early second millennium BC. And, you know, in a way that the, the landscapes we're looking at and the settlements that have been talked about um, indicate a, a sort of continuation of that practice, but a, but a sense of it finding a new, a new place in the landscape or new places having to be fashioned in landscapes in order to kind of accommodate pastoralism, but with a degree of sedentism or perhaps a sort of commitment or, or um, greater intensity of use of places um, that, that characterizes the 17th century onwards. Um, so it's, you know, there's, there's an element to which pastoralism continues, but it, but it has to be um, uh, kind of modified to take account of the, the very different ways and ways in which people occupied and lived uh, lived in places and, and the duration in which people stayed in places. Yeah, I guess another thing I was thinking about, um, which sort of relates to this question of um, mobility or, or, or sedentism, is, is, is you all discussed uh, material densities in, in different ways. And I was trying to get my head around, how do you do these comparisons between sites? Because um, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? And um, uh, I think Alex talked about uh, densities per cubic meter and um, or you can talk about the volumes of material recovered um, and then you try to sort of um, knit it together and it's actually quite hard to <laughs> to, to work out how much stuff there was. Um, no, I mean, even on that one site on Slade End Farm and trying to compare one area to the next it's really not straightforward to interpret you know what might or may not be a settlement area and then you get a random pit with lots of things in I mean you know, what exactly does that mean even even on one even in one landscape let alone between between landscapes and sites but it's so important to our sort of understanding of of um i guess people staying still isn't it well it could be a combination of the two can't it i mean it could be making place but still moving around in place um but in a more a controlled way because land is becoming more formally owned there's a sort of element of ownership and privacy through all these boundaries appearing and using human remains to kind of legitimate that in some way I mean those inhumations look really interesting the crouched people <laughs> and um, with the combination of cremations as well there's a kind of articulation really of um, yeah using human remains in a in a and the source is early, you know, which which relates to resonates with the early part of the Bronze Age, where human remains are present in place, and those places become um, owned, private, used. Um, the idea of common lands starts to appear. I just don't know. I mean, it's, it's got that kind of sort of. Um, it's where it's going for me, anyway. So yeah. Where's the lithic on all this? Have you got any Neolithic uh, on these sites? Well, what I find quite frustrating, I don't know about the Neolithic, there's not a lot of Neolithic on most of these sites, I think. Um, what I find quite frustrating is that on a lot of these sites, um, we've got early Bronze Age activity of some kind or another, whether that's funerary activity uh, or some clusters of pits uh, that, that precedes the Middle Bronze Age uh, settlements. But at the same time, it's very difficult I think, to, to get any real sense of an early Bronze Age to Middle Bronze Age transition. Uh, the, the, the character of the Middle Bronze Age activity is so different, uh, and it's often not clear whether it does actually directly chronologically follow on 
um, that actually sort of grasping that, that, that transitional period at any one site, I think is often very difficult. Um, I don't know what other people think about that. Yeah, I mean, at the Wallingford sites, there are, there's a fair bit of Neolithic, but it's mainly early Neolithic and middle Neolithic. Um, a little bit of late Neolithic and, and Beaker, but very, very little early Bronze Age at either of the sites. And also, as I said, there's no late Bronze Age. So we've got this kind of middle Bronze Age activity, which isn't clearly preceded by anything visible, at least, or, or the other way. Or, then there's a big break again at the end of the period. And this kind of break between the potential break between sites, as, as Leo said, between the early and middle Bronze Age, maybe is a is a theme and something something different happening then. And is this partly because we don't have uh, enduring use of places, even in the um, even across the sort of seventeenth to fourteenth centuries BC? There's still shifting settlement. What we don't have in the kind of context of of anywhere in Britain, I guess, so there's um, certainly not in southern Britain, are the, the kinds of uh, long term settlements that you might imagine in a kind of Central European type context or, you know, where you, where you get um, uh, inhabitation of the same place over century after century after century. So you can pick up on those transitions and understand those transformations. Um, in order to kind of get at that transformation, we have to look at a different scale. We have to step back and, and think about the landscape as a whole rather than. Uh, the the story of an uh, an individual place. I'm well, sorry, I'm trying to read these uh, questions which have been coming in. Oh right, yeah. Sure. I know. I mean, I take it everybody else has got this, have they? Yeah. They're quite detailed. Some of these. They want to pick up one of one of these. About what do the panels think comes earlier in the broader perspective? Widespread field systems or roundhouses? And do they feel that they emerge together? And that's definitely something I was thinking about as well. It's very difficult to relate, isn't it? The settlement and the fields, however hard you date them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's often seems to be something of a disconnect, really, between the two. Certainly, you do get some roundhouses very early, you know, in the um, sort of sixteenth and even seventeenth century. So, right at the beginning of the, the Middle Bronze Age. But I think I, it's worth saying again. I, I do think that you know you do get some areas where you, you aren't seeing any of the roundhouses for for quite some time, even though you do get the uh, the field systems. Exactly, and with you know with poor preservation of these structures, then <laughs> makes it even more difficult, really, to try and uh, answer that question and um you know more dating i guess would be required um in in the um the didcot landscape which i very briefly uh talked about the the earliest part of the middle bronze age in the 17th century or was it the early 16th uh, you have a small um settlement with two or three roundhouses in the four post structure and then that is then succeeded by the uh the, the bigger coaxial system and within that, there's only one kind of small house in, in one of the corners of one of the enclosures. So in that, in that landscape, you've got this kind of settlement and then that's, that's then succeeded by a, a field system without really as clear roundhouse evidence uh, settlement you know, as, as it was in the earlier period. Hmm. Or you get the situation like a, um, a Bradley Fen in Cambridgeshire where the fields definitely um, precede the main um, period of roundhouse occupation so you've got a very different relationship there I was wondering um, at, at Clay Farm um, was any refitting attempted between the midden deposit in the um, ditch and mm -hmm. the um, material from the settlement that was 100 metres away because you discussed you know the possibility that people were moving stuff across the um, yeah so unfortunately there was hardly any any pottery from the, where the actual structures came from or even the ditches um, Adjacent, there were. I mean, a very good refitting from the mid material itself, but uh, which, which, yeah, was clear and also almost evidence for the different middens and you know perhaps uh, you know one where there'd been a, a, a pile of pottery and one where there'd been a pile of animal bone and, and work flint because within the within the ditch 
the assemblages of stuff and the refitting came from almost different different parts of it. So, but yeah, in terms of trying to refit with other parts, very difficult because it all seems to be in that one one location. I should say that one issue that always worries me with with a lot of these questions we're talking about in terms of landscape use and density of settlement uh, is is whether the field methods that are typically used in, in British field archaeology are meaning that we're only really picking up certain kinds of sites. So, I mean, our evaluation, trial trenching and, and geophysics and looking at crop marks is very good at identifying nice substantial settlement enclosures and, and field systems, um, but possibly not so good at picking up other kinds of sites that may be there that uh, produce a more ephemeral archaeological trace. Um, so I, I do worry that, you know, for example, that the, that the sites that I was talking about in Somerset, all of them are quite substantial enclosed sites um but is that really mm. all that was going on? i think on? it's a similar thing in in norfolk really i mean not just just because perhaps the the soil um it's not kind on on pottery and there are undoubtedly areas of bronze age field system that probably have been excavated you know in small bits of field work and evaluations but you know unless you're getting the signals unless you're hitting the bullseye of the the settlements themselves it's very difficult to to be able to interpret them or date them correctly i i guess that for me success comes from success so the idea that this kind of landscape suddenly emerges out of a of a nothingness doesn't work these populations are already there and they're already being successful and this is a rethinking of the way the landscape works for them so again, I, I, I'm just interested in what comes before all this, where it all comes from, why it suddenly emerges in the way it does. Yeah, so again, you have a, a question of visibility, really, in that you've got classically, and I think this is still being shown, you've got the, the domestic and the field systems of the Middle Bronze Age being visible. And the, the early Bronze Age, that's not the sort of thing that is visible. So although it's laid and farm, there aren't any um, early Bronze Age <clears throat> pits or burials, it doesn't mean, of course, they weren't living there and not depositing things in subsoil features that we then find. Can I pick up on a question that um, Gail Higginbottom's put in the Q&A? Hmm. So she, she asked, yeah. if there is so much variation in this region at the middle and macro-ish level, what do the panellists see as a unifying theme? Cattle, enclosures? And it was something that I was thinking about all along um, through all of your talk, because there are, you know, there's, there's, a, there's some commonalities that, that were coming out, like the, the dominance of cattle, associations with human remains, possible associations with settlement, the paucity of evidence for cereal cultivation, some associations with metalwork and dating difficulties. Um, and then there's these, this sort of massive diversity in architectural manifestations of enclosure and boundary um, and the material densities and the sort of organization and layout of these settlements. Yeah. I don't know, did, did anyone else come out with anything that made more sense? No, I, mean, uh, I suppose one response might be that um, there's, uh, the part of the diversity relates to kind of experimentation, experimentation with the idea of the house as a, as a place in which to to live, but also as a place as which to kind of landmark um, your your kind of presence. And the the second, might, I suppose, experimentation in in boundary building in different ways, which I think is really striking with those Norfolk sites. The sense that you know yeah. that, that what a field is is not something that's sort of fixed in any sense, and, and certainly in terms of bounded field, uh, and it it kind of emerges in different different ways and, and often quite fleetingly I suppose you know for a generation or two before transforming into something else you know we don't have those senses of uh, landscape continuity that we're kind of familiar with in our present day landscapes you know where uh, hundreds of years and perhaps even um, even a millennium might be represented in alignments and so on but actually you know, a lot of the, the sites we're looking at here maybe are, are you know much more fleeting um, and I just wonder to what extent that that what's characterizing the early part of this period is this sort of experimentation with 
new technologies are relating to and, and living in land, in landscape, sorry. Yeah, and I think as several people have, have said, you know, these systems didn't, uh, systems of, of fields and enclosures didn't, didn't appear from nowhere and uh, that people had already been living on, on, in these areas for a, for a long time and it was, it was just another stage in the development, I suppose, of the landscape as, as areas were cleared. Um, if you look at clay farm, those early strip fields, you know, that could only have occurred once uh, areas, enough area, uh, enough of the land had been cleared. Yeah, I mean, presumably that's it. You've got lots of lots of openings up going on, haven't you? And the, the resource gathering to build all those post alignments and things is quite considerable in terms of investment and project management. And presumably you're looking at landscapes which might be pioneering in some way by, as, as, as Bob said, about experimentation, you know, um, and therefore making place, but not lasting very long, perhaps, and moving on. You know, in Cornwall, for example, on the, the uplands, what we call the uplands, we've just got so much in the way of visible stonewall roundhouses, Bronze Age, with long histories, probably into the Iron Age and maybe into the Roman period, that um, we've just got um, lots of different morphologies, if you like, of fields and roundhouses. And some of those will be, some of them probably have, they look permanent, but some of them might have quite episodic histories in their permanency, if you see what I mean. So that's, there's a sort of contradiction there. They're permanent because they're there, they've survived. But actually, uh, when, when you start to excavate the interiors of certainly the upland houses, they have very little in the way of occupation surfaces, floors. And um, they, they get reused over a long period of time, perhaps even into the early medieval period, because they're useful anyway. So how unrepresentative then is the material we're seeing? For example, where's all the bronze? I, I, I just feel that this is desperately unrepresentative of, of artifacts or assemblages, which those houses have got control over. Yeah, I mean, I mean, almost total disconnects between uh, the metalworking evidence, which is so important for our study of the Bronze Age, uh, and the settlement evidence is, you know, very frustrating. Um, you know, the, the, the occasional rare find of a, a small bronze object from a settlement or for an occasional rare find of a, of a metalworking mould uh, is all we've got to go on. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I've made a phrase in a slightly less negative way in, 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 in the sense that, you know, the, the study of the Bronze Age has previously been extremely unrepresentative in its focus on metalwork, and now we've got the, the, the settlement evidence and the field systems to, to, to settle alongside it. But I'm actually directly relating the two um, does remain extremely difficult. Well, I just, I mean, I have to say that in Cornwall, we do have, you know, good evidence for metalworking within roundhouse settlements. And some of these roundhouse settlements that have been excavated the last 20 years, mainly through developer funded work, are not the typical sort of stone wall roundhouses we expect maybe in the southwest. They're wooden buildings in settlements which seem to be set aside in a zonation of specialized places as opposed to uh, a fusion of just ordinary domestic farming and metalworking. So there's a hint of that, you, that you've got the rise of specialised places, maybe for um, mm. metalworking. Yeah. OK, so what do we need next? I mean, are we going to carry on digging these sites forevermore or do we need, can we see what more we need? Where, where now does fieldwork go? I'd, I'd say we need to move from beyond digging individual sites and, and, and move to that, that sense of landscape. Well, that is going to involve a completely different set of methodologies and, and a completely different mindset, I think, really, in the way we deal with archaeology within the planning system. Many of these sites being found through geophysical surveys at an evaluation stage, the ones that you're looking at, is that, is that how you're locating them, or as crop marks? Or... Yes, a combination, yes, absolutely. So... The standard approach is sort of geophysical survey and then evaluation and then excavation on those you know, the areas that look to be high potential. Again, a problem with that, as Leo said, is that's good at finding enclosures and field systems, but it's not very good at finding small clusters of post-built roundhouses no. that aren't enclosed. So there is this bias there. And it, it's also not very good for identifying some of the best preserved sites. 
which tend to be around the wetland edge, which can be sort of sealed by colluvial and alluvial deposits. And then we can see, you know, areas that sort of are, are invisible to geophys. And that's when we need sort of more targeted trenching um, that can identify these sort of better preserved sites. Yes. In some ways, I think it's hard to know um, where to go next until all this stuff is synthesized. Um, because, you know, there's, there's so yeah, much. Yeah. So who's gonna, stuff who's gonna do, uh, this is a pet obsession of mine. Who's going to do that synthesis? I mean, we, we've had question. a marvelous collection of material today. Who's going to bring all that together? Is it going to be published as individual sites? Which nobody reads? I mean, very few people read. Who's, who's going to do this work, which is so desperately needed? Yeah, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Theology departments are closing. That's a good question. Is there, a, a, well, I guess, a, a really good point, Jackie, that's just at the point at which sorry, the, the sorry, profession but... is, um, <laughs> is both <laughs> crying out for um, I know, I know. archaeologists and equally, you know, I suppose, looking for mechanisms for us to kind of engage with this material in a, in a at a kind of broader level and to tell meaningful narratives from this material that change how we think about the period you know we're, we're also find ourselves uni with universities kind of shutting their departments and and cutting back on on the provision for archaeological education and research um and it's kind of deeply worrying not deeply worrying it's deeply angering really um, Absolutely, and it's yeah. a failure at all sorts of levels to kind of engage with uh, why archaeology is important, why culture is important. To be honest, um, but the I, I suppose to offer a more practical suggestion to that that challenge of where we how we move on in terms of synthesis, we were actually quite good, I suppose, at one level of synthesizing regionally through things like the regional research frameworks and so on. And there's lots of really impressive work goes on at that level, kind of collating and synthesizing. Um, and maybe there's a, a challenge there to um, historic England and others to kind of fund the capacity to step back and, and begin connecting those region, bits of regional work more effectively and on a, on a continuing basis um, in, in order that uh, synthesis happens you know, at, that, at that sort of national scale and, 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 and beyond. And the other thing I'd say, about, I suppose, just well, I've got the floor, I suppose, about synthesis is the, you know, one of the things we've picked up on a number of times through uh, the, the session has been around chronologies and about the importance of chronology. And, and, and actually, one of the things that's hard to pull together beyond the kind of site level are, are, the, are the radiocarbon dates or the scientific dates more generally. And I think as we push more and more for, for really strong scientific dating, strategies at site level we also yeah. need a kind of a, a framework so that the, those same scientific dates are available you know cross regionally and easily accessible and are then kind of engaged with modeled at that scale as well and that's it's quite a hard thing to do at the moment because the um the, the dates aren't widely or easily shared um, anyway that's my, but the, but my the, comments the, on synthesis <laughs> But the good thing we've seen here, I think, is everybody making good use of Bayesian modelling because it's so critical to get a, for a handle on chronologies. You know, I mean, it's you know, you, you shouldn't be digging these sites unless you've got opportunities to get get good dating sequences. I mean, you are. That's what I'm saying. So I would see that a major step, major advance, ma major step forwards because it's the nuances of these site histories and biographies that we need to sort of really sort of dig deep into to really understand what's going on. Um, and that's, that's, that's great, that's really good, you know, and, and long may you keep doing the Bayesian modeling and finding this, the stuff today, because they're the, they're the critical things. Um, oh, okay, can I then ask the, the excavators, Oxford Archaeology, where, what's your frustration now? Are you happy with the way your work is being treated? Are you happy with the simply just churning out these results, or do you want more from this? I mean, I, I, I think you know one of the frustrating things that we find um, that, that, that hinders getting this 
sense of, of the wider use of landscape and, and, and hinders that sort of more general synthesis it is, the, is the way that um, uh, work within a development-led context is so fragmented between different organisations. Um, so you'll find even, even within one particular very local landscape, you know, you might have half a dozen different organisations um, digging little bits of that landscape. And then of course, the analysis and, and the writing up of that is, is very fragmented. And some of it may never see the light of day in, in terms of an accessible report. So, I mean, these are, you know, obviously we do what we can by, by you know, taking a collaborative approach with speaking to, our, to other units and, and working with them where possible. Um, but obviously just, just, just the structure of the way that um, development funding archaeology is, is set up does um, present a major stumbling block there. Yeah, and I think kind of we're in a, we are in good, a good position to do these syntheses because we can um, we've got the information and the data and we're familiar with the sites, but it's just the money and the funding to yeah. kind of push it further, push it beyond um, normal kind of discussion levels. We're you know, publishing the site and then a discussion level which does synthesize and bring things together, but to push it that much further, there's it's it's difficult within sort of site projects to you know to get the budget to really to really do that yeah, so definitely. some more way of you know more money to do what do what we want to do but that, that, that's, that's exactly right i mean in organizations like ours and, and and other field units you know we've got the capacity and, and the willingness to produce more synthesis but we, we can't for example um apply for research council funding in our own right uh, the sort of funding structures that are there they're just not set up um for for an organization like ours uh, and that, that, that's quite frustrating. I, I think one of our challenges as well, we, you know, we do, we, you know, we do bring a lot of this work, you know, to, to publication and to journals and to, you know, to monographs, but actually how many people actually read, you know, by the monographs, how many actually people sort of look at these journals. And, and I think there's, there's an element, you know, we spend all this money we spend all this time doing all this very detailed analysis and we contribute to these wider discussions, but then sometimes in the local communities, they don't, it sort of passes them by. And it's, it's, I guess, bridging that gap between getting the material for academics to, you know, analyze that data, to actually use that data um, to sort of better knowledge, but also how do we get people to engage with their, you know, their regional and their local sort of heritage? Yeah. So we need to rethink the structure of British archaeology. Yeah. Can I just, sorry, I haven't got an answer to that, but um, I've just noticed that in the question and answer in the chat, there's a couple of questions about revolution. And I feel like that we haven't touched on that topic yet. Um, okay. although it's, um, so uh, Stuart Needham mentioned the Stevens and Fuller article um, about yeah. the temporal distribution of grain. So their argument for a Middle Bronze Age agricultural revolution. Um, and then Ros um, Maldoon, I don't know if I've got pronounced your surname right, uh, said, if we don't envisage a major shift re revolution in the transition from the early to Middle Bronze Age, where would we place the change from the early to late Bronze Age? The characteristics of which are surely very different. Or, or do you see Middle Bronze Age as belonging to early Bronze Age type systems or late Bronze Age type systems? Not sure I have an answer. <laughs> but does anybody who excavated these sites? I do think there is definitely a, a difference in the late Bronze Age. And I think mainly the um, you don't get these enclosures and fill systems as much. And also I think that does have a, an impact again on visibility and how much we, we excavate these sites. Um, I think late Bronze Age sites generally aren't as visible and certainly they're, they're not coming up as much as the Middle Bronze Age. Yeah, I think the, the pattern just changes again, doesn't it? Definitely. Um, there are, I think there are some, some areas where there's a case to be said for, the, for ditches and enclosed systems still, still being built into the late Bronze Age, but any standard, for example, I mean, on the whole, that sort of that sort of need, that ditch digging uh, seems to stop, you know, around 1200, 1150 BC. And then you get, you know, unenclosed settlements, sometimes, sometimes in new locations, sometimes uh, within areas of Middle Bronze Age field system. And so 
where you can identify them through pottery, great. But like Alex says, when you haven't got those those obvious ditch systems and enclosures to to, to pick out, it's quite it can be quite difficult to pick up like Bronze Age settlement. But there is, you know, there's there is is a very there's there is still quite a dense pattern of like Bronze Age settlement activity in in East Anglia. It's just, so it's presumably just those ditches than... produce banks, and once those banks exist, they exist forever. Absolutely. More. Yeah. So I mean, Clay Farm is a very good example that quite unusually very little evidence of late Bronze Age activity. But then in the early Iron Age, part of the system, um, yeah, is just used, reused um, early Iron Age structures, roundhouses, pit groups. And lots of early Iron Age material right in the in the upper fills of the of the Middle Bronze Age enclosure ditches and, and radiocarbon dates to go with it. I mean, at Waddingford and Didcot, these, you've kind of got the opposite of that. You've got these um, Middle Bronze Age enclosures on a particular alignment, uh, very little or no Late Bronze Age evidence, but then uh, Middle Iron Age enclosures all on different alignments. And actually, those Middle Iron Age alignments are then continued on through the Roman and post roman yeah. and modern period but the, the, there is i think an abandonment and a, uh the, the the general kind of its landscape system yeah kind of ending and and there not being a continuation in banks or hedges yeah so there's a revolution going on there isn't there i mean you know there's a there's a, a reset button that's happening yeah. yeah there's many uh questions which we've got coming in will they be dealt with because i don't feel as though i've been dealing with anything here on screen i've been floundering around really <laughs> yeah it's, just, it's, it's been it's been one of those evenings hasn't it and uh, th th thanks for everyone for, for, for persevering with this uh, we've had all kinds of, of technical issues um yes i mean i, I think probably unfortunately we, we are sort of running short on time now uh, probably should wrap it up quite shortly so let, let, let people get to their, 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 their dinners or their, their children or whatever they've got to deal with um, so unfortunately, we probably won't have uh, a chance to um, answer all of these questions, I'm afraid. But they will, they um, will be dealt with, will they? They will be um, dealt with. I, I, I think there may be a way that we can... Yeah, um, yeah. be good to respond, perhaps, to some yeah. of them. You can yeah. share them, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. We, we, yeah. We, 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 we're looking to do that. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's any um, uh, any of the other panellists like to uh, address any of the, 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 the particular questions now or or whether we've no well i i i i'm like john i've the, there's so much to digest because there's yeah. such a wealth of stuff that's come out and i'd like to say thank you very much for sharing you know it's br brilliant you know and it's got me thinking about lots of things and so i'm yeah. quite happy to digest and come back you know yeah. Yeah. absolutely i i think that enormous thanks should go to Oxford Archaeology to all the other units who are working. And I think that we need now for them to do the synthesis. And there needs to be some way of, of achieving that. Okay, great. Thanks, John. So I think, I think it just remains for me to say thank you as well to, to everyone that, that, that's joined us today uh, and asked such great questions. And I'm sorry we weren't able to, to get around to all of them. Um, thanks very much to our invited panelists, Jackie Novakovsky, Amin Cooper, Robert Johnston, and John Barrett. Uh, thanks as well to Annie Bayard, who, who ran the Zoom session. Uh, and of course, a very big thank you to all of the Oxford Archaeology staff who worked on all of these projects that we've been discussing today, uh, including those who worked in the field in all weathers, yeah. uh, and those who worked in the office processing the material, a specialist in post text illustrators and archivists, uh, to, to name just a few. Uh, these projects would not have been a success without the, the hard work of all of them. Yeah. Um, so this po presentation will be made available in due course uh, on YouTube. Um, please do visit uh, the Oxford Archaeology website uh, and check out our social media uh, for news and details of, of future events. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for watching.